Hello everyone, welcome back to Disturbing Humanity and it has been an extremely long time since I have posted on this channel as you can clearly see um, and the reason for that is just it takes a really long time and a lot of effort to make these kinds of videos so I sort of just dropped off because I got burnt out and then I was gonna come back and then I didn't and now I'm just like you know I'm just gonna try again and see what happens so yeah um I am going to be doing a video today which I started planning a while ago and then I sort of just you know gave up on it but then I came back to it literally yesterday and I wrote like the entire script and it's about almost 3,000 words so um yeah I hope you enjoy it and yeah so this video is about the Andes flight disaster you may or may not have heard of this case I can't remember where I even heard about it but the defining feature of the case is the fact that the survivors resorted to cannibalism uh yeah they ate their dead friends so that they could survive so that is the disturbing nature of this and it's also an absolutely incredible story of survival the ones that actually made it out alive through all of the shit that they went through it's actually unbelievable their sheer tenacity and their will to keep surviving in any way that they could it's it's amazing so let's get into it so in 1972 a small plane known as the uruguayan air force flight 571 was on course from montevideo uruguay to santiago also disclaimer pronunciation if i get it wrong really sorry try my best but um there is a lot of <laughs> very difficult things to pronounce so apologies I think I said that right though Santiago Chile I'm pretty sure it's Chile isn't it it's not Chile it's Chile <laughs> anyway on board were 40 passengers and five crew members including the old Christians Club rugby union team as well as friends and family they were scheduled to play a match against the Old Boys Club from England in Santiago, so the club president Daniel Juan chartered a Uruguayan Air Force twin turboprop Fairchild F6227D to fly them over the Andes Mountains to Santiago. My god, that was a mouthful. The pilot was Colonel Julio Cesar Ferradas, who had a total of 5,117 flying hours and was accompanied by co-pilot Lieutenant Colonel Dante Hector Lagarara, who he was training at the time. Lagarara was at the controls when the incident occurred and he failed to notice that the instrument readings indicated that he was still 60 to 70 kilometres away from the airport that the craft was due to land in which was the Pudahul airport. He began to descend the aircraft and it struck a mountain, taking off both wings and the tail section of the plane. The remaining fuselage slid down a glacier and descended about 2,379 feet before crashing into ice and snow. Three crew members and nine passengers died immediately and several more died soon afterward due to the temperatures and their severe injuries. Two crew members and three passengers in the tail section were killed when it broke apart, who were Lieutenant Ramon Saul Martinez, Ovida Ramirez, Gaston Costmal, Alejo Huni, and Guido Magri. A few seconds later, Daniel Shaw and Carlos Valeta fell out of the rear fuselage. Valeta survived the fall, but fell down the glacier into deep snow and was asphyxiated. At least four others died from the impact of the fuselage hitting the snowbank, who were Dr. Francisco Nicola and his wife Esther Nicola, Eugenia Parado and Fernando Vasquez. The pilot Ferradas died instantly when the nose gear compressed the instrument panel against his chest, forcing his head out of the window, and co-pilot Lagarara was trapped in the crashed cockpit. 
he actually asked a passenger to find his gun and shoot him, to which the passenger declined. 33 people remained alive, although many were seriously injured, many suffering from broken legs due to the aircraft seats collapsing forward against the luggage partition and the pilot's cabin. Robert Canessa and Gustavo Savino, who were medical students, rushed to assess people's injuries and treat those that they were able to. Fernando Parado had a skull fracture and was in a coma for three days, and Enrique Platero had a piece of metal in his abdomen that, when removed, brought a few inches of his intestines with it, and both of Arturo Nogueira's legs were broken in several places. None of the passengers with compound slash open fractures, which don't look this up unless you want to be really grossed out because I there's a picture on the Wikipedia article and it's gross. Uh, but if you don't know what that is, it's a type of bone fracture that has an open wound in the skin near the fractured bone. So essentially those who don't want to look at a picture, it's when the bone is just kind of sticking out of your leg, you know, for example, that was what the picture of a bone sticking out of a leg. So none of the people that had these open fractures survived. The wreck was located at an elevation of 11,710 feet in the Andes Mountains in western Argentina, east of the border of Chile. It had crashed about 13 miles from an abandoned resort and hot springs that may have been able to provide them temporary shelter, but sadly, the survivors were unaware of this. Authorities would fly over the crash site several times in the following days in search of the aircraft, but they were unable to see them because of the snow. They were essentially like a little dot in the snow and were incredibly hard to see from the height that they were flying at. Um, and the survivors, they saw these aircraft, they tried really hard to get their attention, they even arranged some of the suitcases into a cross to try and signal to them that that's where they were, but unfortunately they did not see them. And then the search would be cancelled after eight days. During the first night, five more people would die. Lagarara, Francisco Abal, Graziella Morani, Philippe Macurian and Julio Martinez Lamas. The survivors removed the broken seats and other debris from the aircraft and built a makeshift shelter. Adolfo Strout came up with a way to get water by using sheet metal from under the seats and putting snow on it. The solar collector melted the snow which then dripped into empty wine bottles. To help prevent snow blindness, which if you don't know what that is, it's a temporary type of temporary eye damage that is caused by UV light reflecting from the snow. He managed to make three pairs of sunglasses using the sun visors in the pilot's cabin, wire and a brass strap. They also used seat covers to help keep themselves warm and used seat cushions as snowshoes. I apologise for the cat. Nando Parado woke up from his coma after three days to find that his mother had died and his 19-year-old sister Susanna was severely injured. He tried to keep her alive, but during the eighth day, she unfortunately passed away. The remaining 27 suffered greatly trying to survive the th minus 30 degrees Celsius night, as they lacked cold weather clothing and food. They did find a small radio jammed between some seats of the aircraft and heard news about the search being cancelled. An excerpt from the book about the disaster called Alive, the story of the Andes survivor, describes what happens after this discovery. The others who had clustered around Roy, upon hearing the news, began to sob and pray, all except Parado, who looked calmly up at the mountains which rose to the west. Gustavo Nikolic came out of the aircraft and seeing their faces, knew what they had heard. He climbed through the hole in the wall of the suitcases and rugby shirts, crouched at the mouth of the dim tunnel, and looked at the mournful faces which were turned towards him. Hey boys, he shouted. There's some good news. We just heard on the radio. They've called off the search. Inside the crowded aircraft, there was silence. As the hopelessness of their predicament enveloped them, they wept. Why the hell is that good news? Payers shouted angrily at Nikolic. Because it means, he said, that we're going to get out of here on our own. The courage of this one boy prevented a flood of total despair. Now, 
we move on to the horrifying and defining subject of this case, which is cannibalism. What I talked about at the beginning. So, due to the survivors having a very limited supply of food, which included eight chocolate bars, a tin of mussels, three small jars of jam, a tin of almonds, a few dates, candies, dried plums, and bottles of wine. They divided this into small amounts between them to make it last as long as possible. For example, Parado ate a single chocolate-covered peanut over three days. So this is just how dire the situation was. Even with the strict rationing, though, they ran out of food very quickly and because they were in the mountains, there was no natural vegetation or animals. The food ran out after a week, so the survivors attempted to eat parts of the plane, such as cotton from inside the seats and leather. This made them very ill, though, so it was not sustainable. So faced with the very real threat of starvation and death, those who were still alive agreed that if they were to die, the others could consume their bodies to live. So they got permission from everyone to say, you know, if I am to die, you can eat me to stay alive. Roberto Canessa recounts what it was like to make this decision. We had long since run out of the meagre pickings we'd found on the plane, and there was no vegetation or animal life to be found. After just a few days, we were feeling the sensation of our own bodies consuming themselves just to remain alive. Before long, we would become too weak to recover from starvation. We knew the answer, but it was too terrible to contemplate. The bodies of our friends and teammates, preserved outside in snow and ice, contained vital, life-giving protein that could help us survive. But could we do it? For a long time, we agonised. I went out in the snow and prayed to God for guidance. Without his consent, I felt I'd be violating the memory of my friends, that I would be stealing their souls. We wondered whether we were going mad to even contemplate such a thing. Had we turned into brute savages? Or was this the only sane thing to do? Truly, we were pushing the limits of our fear. Knessa would use broken glass from the aircraft windshield as a cutting tool to remove flesh, and later on several others would follow this example. Some were able to consume the meat offered to them, but a few would either refuse it or were unable to keep it down. Parado protected the corpses of his sister and mother, and they were never eaten. They dried out some of the flesh in the sun, which did make it more edible, and initially were so repulsed by the experience that they only consumed skin, muscle, and fat. Once the supply of flesh was diminished, though, they did also eat hearts, lungs, and even brains. In the end, all of those who survived had done so by consuming bodies. Javier Methel and his wife Liliana were the last survivors to eat human flesh. They had very strong religious convictions and only agreed to eat the flesh after viewing it like Holy Communion. 17 days after the crash on the 29th of October, tragically an avalanche would strike the aircraft containing the survivors as they slept. This would wipe out eight people. Enrique Platero, Liliana Methel, Gustavo Nikolic, Daniel Maspons, Juan Menendez, Diego Storm, Carlos Roque, and Marcello Perez. The death of Perez was particularly detrimental because he had assumed a leadership role within the group. The avalanche buried the fuselage and filled the interior to within one metre of the roof. The remaining survivors soon realised they were running out of air, But luckily, Parado found a metal pole from the luggage racks, and they were able to get one of the windows from the pilot's cabin open, enough to poke a hole through the snow, which then provided them ventilation. On the 31st of October, they managed to dig a tunnel from the cockpit to the surface, only to then encounter a furious blizzard, which left them no choice but to stay inside. For three days, they remained trapped in the extremely cramped space with about one metre of headroom, with the corpses of those who had died in the avalanche. With no other choice, on the third day, they began to eat the raw flesh of their newly deceased friends. Parado later said, 
It was soft and greasy, streaked with blood and bits of wet gristle. I gagged hard when I placed it in my mouth. Before the avalanche, a few survivors became insistent that the only way of survival would be to climb over the mountains and find help. Because of Lagarara's dying statement that the aircraft had passed Kuriko, they believed that the Chilean countryside was only a few kilometres away. They were actually more than 89 kilometres to the east. They made several brief expeditions in the first few weeks after the crash, but found that altitude sickness, dehydration, snow blindness, malnourishment and extreme cold in the night made travelling any significant distance impossible. However, on one of these expeditions, they found luggage containing a box of chocolates, three meat patties, a bottle of rum, cigarettes, clothes, comic books, and a little medicine. They also found the aircraft's two-way radio. They would then spend the night by a fire reading comic books and continued the expedition the next day. On the second night, which was their first night sleeping outside, they nearly froze to death so decided to return to the fuselage shelter and remove the aircraft's batteries to power the radio and make an SOS call for help. Unfortunately, this would not work, so they realised the only way they would be rescued is climbing out of the mountains. On the 15th of November, Arturo Nogueira died, and three days later, Rafael Echevarin died from gangrene due to infected wounds. Numa Turkati was the next to die on the 11th of December, weighing only 55 pounds. The survivors then heard on the radio that the Uruguayan Air Force had resumed the search. The only way out was to climb over the mountains to the west, and they knew that due to the freezing temperatures they would not survive through the nights on the trek. They made sleeping bags from insulation, copper wire, and waterproof fabric that covered the air conditioning of the place. On the 12th of December, Parado, Canessa and Vizintin began to climb the glacier at 11,710 feet to the 15,320-foot peak, blocking their way west. The trek lasted for over 10 days and they travelled a total of 38 miles. Because they believed that they were closer to Curaco than they thought, they only brought a three-day supply of meat. Parado wore three pairs of jeans and three sweaters over a polo shirt, as well as four pairs of socks wrapped in plastic bags. They believed they would reach the peak in one day. On the first night, they struggled to find somewhere to put down their sleeping bags, but managed to find a spot on a ledge of rock on the edge of an abyss. On the second day, Canessa thought he saw a road to the east and tried to persuade Parado to go in that direction, but he disagreed and they argued without reaching a decision. On the third day, Canessa stayed at the camp while Vizintin and Parado reached a wall more than 300 feet tall encased in snow and ice. Parado used a stick from his pack to carve steps in the wall, and once at the high peak he expected to see the green valleys of Chile, but all he could see were mountain peaks in every direction. The next morning, they could see it was going to take much longer than they thought, and they were running out of food. Vizintin decided to return to the crash site, and he used an aircraft seat as a makeshift sleigh to go downhill, and he was there within an hour. The, the thing that these men thought of, they were so smart. So smart, and that's why they survived. Like, they were able to improvise and think of ways to do things, and it's just, it's crazy. Parado and Canessa spent three hours climbing to the summit, and when Canessa reached the top and saw nothing but snow-covered mountains around them, he thought that was it. They were dead. But Parado saw two smaller peaks on the horizon that were not covered in snow. He was sure that this was their way out, and Canessa agreed to go west. Much later, Canessa learned that the road he saw to the east would have resulted in them being rescued sooner. They hiked for several more days until they reached the river Rio San Jose and followed it until they reached the snow line. Gradually, they discovered signs of human presence, firstly evidence of camping, and then on day nine they saw the cows. That night they were building a fire and spotted the three men on horseback on the other side of the river. Parado tried to call out to them, but the noise of the river made it impossible to hear clearly. One of the men saw him and shouted, Tomorrow! and the next day he returned. 
He wrote a note and attached it with a pencil to a rock, and he threw the message across the river to Parado. I come from a plain that fell in the mountains. I am Uruguayan. We have been walking for ten days. I have a wounded friend up there. In the plain there are still fourteen injured people. We have to get out from here quickly and we don't know how. We don't have any food. We are weak. When are you going to come fetch us? Please, we cannot even walk. Where are we? Sergio Catalan, a Chilean muleteer, which is somebody who transports goods using pack animals, read the note and gave them a sign that he understood, threw bread to them across the river, and then rode on horseback west for 10 hours to find help. During his trip, he saw another muleteer and asked him to reach the men and bring them to Los Metans. He then followed the river to its junction with Rio Tangarica, I'm sorry, that one's really difficult, where he crossed a bridge and was able to reach the village of Puente Negro and stop a truck who gave him a ride to the police station. They relayed the news of the survivors to the army in San Fernando, who contacted the army in Santiago. Meanwhile, Parado and Canessa were brought on horseback to Los Metens, where they were given food and rested. They had hiked a total of 38 miles over 10 days, and Canessa had lost almost half of his body weight, a total of 97 pounds. The Chilean Air Force provided three Bell UH-1 helicopters to assist with the rescue, and Parado volunteered to help lead them to the crash site. One helicopter remained behind as a reserve. The pilots were astounded at the difficult terrain that the two men had crossed to get help. On the 22nd of December 1972, the two helicopters carrying search and rescue teams reached the crash site, but due to the altitude and weight limits, they were only able to rescue half of the survivors at that time. Four members of the search and rescue team volunteered to stay with the other seven survivors still on the mountain. They slept a final night in the fuselage with the search and rescue party, and the second flight of helicopters arrived the following morning. The survivors were carried to hospitals in Santiago for evaluation and were treated for conditions such as altitude sickness, dehydration, frostbite, broken bones, scurvy and malnutrition. In normal circumstances, the search and rescue team would have brought back the dead for burial, but authorities and the victims' families decided to bury the remains near the site in a common grave. Thirteen bodies were untouched, while fifteen others were mostly skeletal. The remains of the fuselage was then doused in gasoline and set alight. And that's basically where the story ends. I did watch like a two hour documentary on this with the actual survivors speaking. So it it's all in Spanish, but it's with subtitles. So if you want to watch it, it's called Stranded. I found it quite easy to watch online, um, and it, but it's interesting hearing it from their perspective and you can see um, that it was recorded about 30 years after it happened and you can still see like the horror on their faces when they talk about what they had to do clearly it is one of the most traumatizing things that you could go through you know they they didn't know whether the, it was like it was more of a question of when they were going to die and they didn't know how they were going to die it's just insane to think about and they actually go back to that the andes mountains like uh, a couple of the guys went and they took their daughters there and then they are talking to their daughters about what happened so check that out if you were interested in this story if you want to hear first-hand accounts from the survivors themselves and they they did a press conference after to say everything that happened because they didn't want to tell the media about the cannibalism uh, initially because they didn't want it to be disrespectful to the dead so they were all very religious they all believed in god and they all you know framed it as a sort of holy communion thing and that their friends kept them alive and kept them going and as sad as it is it's it's good to know that at least some of them made it out alive but 
uh, rest in peace to all of the people that lost their lives as a result of this disaster and my heart goes out to the families that lost people but that that is it for this story if you want to know any more information there is a lot of stuff on the internet i took most of my information from the wikipedia so check that out if you want to know it in more detail because i obviously condensed it to put into video form this video actually wasn't as long as i thought it was going to be i thought it was obviously going to be like an hour long but yeah that that is it for now and if you actually have any suggestions of any cases that you want me to talk about please do let me know but I am gonna be looking for more things that I can talk about anyway so yeah I will see you in my next video bye